Athletes do it, CEOs do it, people in the office and home do it. What I'm talking about is trash talking. But how does it affect the people who are actually its targets? Here to talk about the issue are Wharton Professor uh, Maury Schweitzer and uh, Wharton uh, Lecturer and Research Scholar Jeremy Yip. Uh, welcome. Both of them have written a uh, co-written a paper, a research paper on this very issue. Um, and they're here to give us more details. So uh, tell us about the premise of your paper. The premise of our paper is to provide, we're the first to provide an initial conceptualization of trash talking and some empirical evidence of the interpersonal effects of trash talking on competitive behavior. So we often think about trash talking in the forum of sports and politics, but it features quite prominently in organizational life. I'll give you an example that illustrates trash talking in organizational life. So you may be familiar with the London Eye. To celebrate the new millennium, the city of London constructed the London Eye, a giant Ferris wheel that sits on the shore of the River Thames. And while you may be familiar with the London Eye, which you might not know, is that they uh, had British Airways uh, sponsor the construction. In the final stages of construction, as they erected the London Eye into place, they encountered some technical difficulties. Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin Atlantic Airways, decided to capitalize on the misfortune of one of its key competitors and broadcasted a message intended to humiliate British Airways, or BA. He had Virgin Atlantic arrange a blimp to fly over the construction site of the London Eye with a giant banner that read, BA can't get it up. This public insult intensified a long-standing competition between British Airways and Virgin Atlantic, and it's this style of aggressive communication in competition that we explore in our paper and that we'll discuss with you today. So how would you define trash talking? We conceptualize trash talking as competitive incivility. That is, uncivil remarks or aggressive communication that is expressed between competitors. More specifically, we define trash talking as boastful comments about the self or insulting remarks about competitors that are delivered by a competitor, typically before or during a competition. What's interesting is that trash talking also pervades corporate America. So I'll give you a couple of examples of CEOs trash talking. One example is from Dan Ackerson, who was the CEO of GM. So when Ackerson was CEO of GM, he announced that GM would be competing directly with the Mercedes C-Class. They were going to launch a car, a rear-wheel drive car, that would compete directly with the Mercedes C-Class. And when asked what he thought about Mercedes, he said, they call it C-Class because it's very average. John Legere, uh, is another example of a CEO who uh, at T-Mobile who uh, ripped into one of his key competitors, AT&T, when he said, I see more honesty in a Match.com ad than AT&T's coverage maps. So these are just a, a couple of examples of CEOs engaging in trash talking. But we've also, uh, but the question came up, how prevalent is trash talking in the workplace? And so to initiate our study, we conducted a pilot study in which we recruited uh, full-time office workers at Fortune 500 companies. And we asked them to recall an incident where they heard or said uh, an, a boastful or insulting remark at work while competing for resources or recognition. What we found was that uh, uh, we, we received a variety of different incidences that they recalled. But most interestingly, we found that 57% of the employees indicated that trash talking occurs on a monthly or more often than monthly basis. That's a very su surprising statistic. So Professor Schweitzer, can you talk more about uh, your pilot study and the six experiments that went into it? Sure. Uh, so so this, this topic is really pervasive. We see trash talking around us. And what we set out to do is to look at the, the consequences of trash talking. And in particular, what happens to the person who's receiving this trash talking. In, in another pilot study that we ran, we found that people don't anticipate trash talking having a motivational effect, mm -hmm. 
But in fact, very consistently in our studies, we find that targets of trash talking become very motivated. And on effort-based tasks, and we have people doing some pretty mundane things, whether it's counting letters or moving sliders, when people have to exert effort for something, within a competition, if somebody engages in trash talking, so you're a loser, that dollar's mine, I'm gonna beat you like a rented mule, when people are the targets of these kind of messages, what we find is that they become much more motivated, they increase their effort, and the performance goes up. So, so one, one key finding of our work is that targets of trash talking become very motivated. Now, we ran some other studies to show that sometimes they become even so motivated, they're likely to gauge in unethical behavior to win. So what people care about is outperforming this person who's trash talking them. And they're willing to both expend constructive effort, but also engage in unethical behavior to make sure they outperform their competitor. So are there some constructive effects of, um, or destructive effects of, um, of trash talking? Well, there are. So, so in addition to these constructive effects, when we looked at a creative task, we found that trash talking is actually disruptive. So it motivates us, but it's also distracting. And targets of trash talking were less successful completing a creative task than were people who weren't targets of trash talking. So, so that is, trash talking can be motivating to the targets, but it's also distracting to the targets. So how can we use your findings and apply them to our personal lives, our work lives? How can we make this practical? Well, our work informs a number of practical implications. I think first, trash talking, so we can provide uh, prescriptive advice for potential and habitual trash talkers. Uh, trash talkers need to recognize that they may unintentionally be boosting their opponent's motivation and performance. So we encourage trash talkers to engage in deeper perspective taking so that they are able to gauge what the interpersonal consequences are for their rude behavior. I think second, we encourage managers, executives, and coaches to think carefully about when to expose their employees to trash talking. We urge managers to deliberately and strategically expose trash talking to employees once they've considered what task that their employees are performing. So in light of our findings, when employees are working on routine tasks that require effort, exposing them to a trash talking message that was said or broadcasted from their competitor may actually boost their performance. But in, if that performance task is, is more cognitively demanding and involves creativity, then we would find that trash talking may actually diminish their performance. And so managers need to be aware of the different effects on behavior that trash talking can have. So what does trash talking do in cooperative settings? Well, what's interesting is that trash talking can be very destructive in a cooperative setting, whereas it's motivating in a competitive setting. In one of our studies, we had people either cooperate with somebody or compete with somebody. And these were Confederates, paid research assistants, who engaged in the same trash talking behavior in both cases. So they said things like, I can't believe I'm paired with you. I can tell you're such a loser already. And then they either performed a cooperative task or a competitive task. The exact same messages boosted performance in a competitive task but harm performance in a cooperative task. So what contribution does your body of work um, add to existing um, academic um, theory in this, in, this, uh, in this area? Well, our work, um, I think, connects to, to two important literatures. One is the literature on competition and rivalry more specifically. So Jeremy talked about uh, British Airways and Virgin, and here, trash talking is part of that rivalry and competitive environment. And we see 
trash talking motivate people, but also exacerbate ex- exacerbate conflict. We see rivalry as something that typically occurs over a long period of time with competed interactions, but trash talking is a way to fast track that relationship so we can transform you know, normal competitive behavior into a much more intense, more rivalry-like situation with trash talking. The second literature that we would connect this to is literature on incivility. And so there's some very interesting work by Christine Porath and others looking at uncivil behavior in the workplace. And what we do is we find that consistent with that prior work, it's destructive in cooperative settings. So within your organization, trash talking each other is not very useful. But in competitive settings, it might have an interesting role to play. And in some other emerging work that we have, we're beginning to find that the trash talking somebody else's group can actually have a bonding effect on our group. So how will you follow up your research? The current work that we just described focused on the effects of trash talking on the target in dyadic interactions. And some of the more current work that Maurice and I are carrying out investigates the effects of trash talking in group interactions. It's valuable to understand the effects of trash talking between groups and also to understand the consequences for observers who are not necessarily targets. In our current work, um, we are investigating how people who are observers react to trash talking and whether that facilitates group cohesion and functioning. So if we return to the example of Richard Branson, which I opened with, why did Richard Branson go to the trouble of spending all that money and time to have a blimp uh, with a giant banner on it and float it over the construction site? Are there any benefits to doing that? We hypothesize that uh, employees in that situation may respond quite favorably to it and that they may be more likely to identify closely to their organization. And so we've begun collecting data and uh, testing that hypothesis. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu. Thank you.